Hello, everybody. Uh, today, I am delighted to say that we have with us Martin Ziegler, who is the chief sports reporter for The Times, uh, perhaps one of the most prestigious newspapers in the world. Uh, how are you today then, Martin? Yeah, good to be uh, good to be with you at long last. Good man, Martin. When I was doing the research for this, I uh, I tried to figure out a little bit about your background. I mean, I know you went to Leeds University. Um, I know it probably means that you you're about ten years younger than I am. Uh, you started your career, I think, as a, as a journalist at the Mail in uh, not not the Mail, but uh, the Hull Daily Mail in Hull, obviously, before you joined the Press Association. And, and then you rocked up at the Times, what, eight, nine years ago or so. But beyond that, I couldn't even figure out where you were born. So have you got a bit of an interesting background there? Yeah. Um, uh, my parents, before I was born, they, they, they went to, my dad went to work in, in Africa, in Uganda. Um, and the, although my uh, my mother came back to, this country to, to have me uh, born and then so I went to Africa when I was I think about a month a month old and then um, stayed in Uganda and Botswana and Malawi until I was 16 um, came back to the UK um, my parents they 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 moved to a a, a village between Oxfordshire Gloucestershire and then uh, I went to Leeds University and then stayed in the north of England ever since. And you, and you still, I think you still live in Yorkshire, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Still lives just outside Leeds. I, I, I went, I spent five years in Hull. Yeah. Um, then moved to Huddersfield and I joined the Press Association and then to Leeds, yeah. Okay, well, we'll, we'll treat you as an honorary uh, person from the north, which I think is uh, not, not, not a bad place to be. Um, one of the things about your career, Martin, is, and particularly that what you do at the Times, is you are not the sort of reporter who goes to a football game and, and then reports upon, as we might say recently with Everton Football Club, you know, oh, Everton beat Ipswich 2-0 and this is what it was like. You're, you're actually, and I think I've, I've read this somewhere about the, that you, you predominantly do investigative work and you report on the business of football itself. So you're reporter, reporting in the round. How did that come about? Is that what you always wanted to do, or or, or what? Well, my, so my first job, I I was like you know a news reporter going to court, um, that sort of thing, covering news stories, all the sort of grisly things that you do on local local newspaper. And then I even for the for the the Northcliff newspaper group, which the whole Daily Mail was, was was part of, did things like went to during the civil war in Yugoslavia. I went out with the British Army a couple of times, um, so you know proper news reporting. Mm. Um, and then I then I started working for the Press Association Sport, and um, that was a sort of managerial job. Before in about two thousand, I um, I did this took on this role, which is yeah basically doing what I do now, which is covering the sort of business of sport, mainly football, but all sports actually. Yeah, Olympics stuff like that. Um, I think actually what made me really really interested in it is I I went to the World Cup in 1998 um, when Seth Blatter was elected as FIFA president for the first time, and I was absolutely fascinated by the whole sort of procedure. Um, and that was you know the first time I sort of heard about Brian envelopes being handed <laughs> out to delegates and. Uh, which, I mean, which, you know, 10 years later, Blatter himself admitted it happened. Um, he said it wasn't him who had done it, but it was his supporters were basically handing out development money in brown envelopes for people to vote for him. Um, anyway, so I was like intrigued by all that. And so when this opportunity came up to do what was actually a sort of for a sports, for sport was fairly a fairly new role at the time. Mm. A few others did it. Um, and But now... You know, most most media organisations have somebody working in this in this area. And would you say that predominantly now your focus is football, or is it still sport in general? I think it's always football. It has always been the, the biggest part of it because you know for us it's the most popular, isn't it? So um, it, it, it is there. I mean, I, I thought you know, I did a lot of stuff on the Russian drug scandal when that was at its height. Um, 
that's probably been the biggest sort of non-football story. Okay, so when, so when you put a story together, Martin, and and particularly when it may be sensitive, I mean, you talk about Olympics and brown envelopes and and those sort of things. I guess the football and the equivalent of that would be FIFA and, and what has gone on over the years in FIFA. How do you actually get, let's call it an exclusive, I know that's an overused phrase these days, or I think it's overused anyway, but when you've done your research and you've got a story and the Times are going to publish this story as a an exclusive and it's probably going to really have a significant impact on that on that sport or that industry, what's the journey from almost hearing a whisper about something, doing the research and then getting it published? Uh, in in a way that obviously doesn't give palpitations to the lawyers of the company you're working for at the time. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, everything is checked by the lawyers, so um, so that that's one thing. And if if they have any any issues, that they will obviously flag those, and you have to deal with those sorts of um, uh, issues. And and sometimes I come to something that satisfies the lawyers. I mean, it's, you know, it happens that sometimes stories don't ever appear. I've got a couple of stories which never have never seen the light of day because although I was convinced of them that the lawyers thought that, they, it, that the evidence wasn't, wasn't there. Um, so, um, yeah, so the best stories you get when you get hold of a document because, the, you know, you've got it there in black and white it's not sort of hearsay it's not what someone's telling you it, it, it's there in black and white so um yeah, i think when the super league was launched um, about three months before that i got a sort of blueprint of the super league and which was uh you know really really so that was a really good story um and then you know, that was easy to write then three months later, when I broke the news of, this, of the European Super League, that was less easy because I had it to uh, a, a source told me that this was happening. I then had to get it sort of confirmed by somebody else because I hadn't got anything in writing. And then so I, I actually did manage to get a, a very good source to to confirm the fact that well, initially I was told that five of the five of the of the so called big six had signed up to it. And that Manchester City were still holding out, and then uh, so I published that online, and then a, that was checked by the lawyers, and it, it was, a, it was a, a difficult one because none of the clubs would respond mm. and say that was happening. Um, but the, you know, when once the you know, the lawyers were satisfied by the how, how by the sources, and we, we were able to run it, and then I think about twenty minutes later. It was confirmed Manchester City had, had also joined the, the European Super League. So I was, was going to say, to yeah, I was going to say, how late to the party did you think City came, and 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 what what's your overview, overall view about it at the time? That being the European Super League, and, and what do you think about it now? About the European Super League, yeah, or the potential for one? Yeah, um, I thought it was pretty dangerous the game of football actually, and and sort of you know. Highlighted a little, but it, what it did is it highlighted a lot of the issues to me, which is this sort of ongoing struggle between, you know, the big clubs who think they're not getting enough, uh, you know, money for what they're providing, and you know, the rest of football who you know want to have competitive balance and opportunities, and um, you know, don't want to have a closed league, and so it was a, it, it was a especially for you know the likes of Real Madrid and Barcelona for example who mm. have you know had this situation where they're able to sell their own tv rights for a long time and then actually that the, the spanish government effectively stopped that happening mm. um and I, that, I think that's probably why they've been the big drivers of this because i think they feel that they've been sort of they've had their their powers to raise money in their historic way curtailed it's all about money at the end of the day isn't it martin Yes. Yeah. So, so the Super League itself, or the European Super League, is. I think you're right. It 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 is an interesting thing, and and roads all lead to money, and it's about those so-called big clubs believing. And I think you said it that just then in your answer about they don't necessarily think it. I'll put words into your mouth if you don't mind. Uh, they're not getting their fair share, and rather. Uh, 
dodgy, if you like, in the sense of uh, disconnected sort of way. I remember quite recently Sir Jim Ratcliffe talking about his perception that um, the so-called big six in this country would have more influence than they he, he now saw that they had. And he, he almost, in, in a throwaway sense, said, because after all, it's us they want to watch, they being the fans, I think. Do you think that persists generally outside of the, the big six, if you want to call them that, that actually the, the, the sports, you know, broadcast rights and the, and the like for the Premier League is driven by historically those who call themselves the big six? And, and would the league persist if they were not there? I'm not sure that the history, it's the big six necessarily. I mean, I think, I think, I think one has to be accept that Manchester United and Liverpool have have these sort of massive international fan bases for historic reasons, which mm. which other clubs don't really have. I'm not sure if the others in the in the sort of so called big six can can sort of match that. Um, so, I, so I I I actually think. The big six was a sort of convenient power block at the time. I think that's now disappeared, actually. Disappeared in what sense? Well, I just I think that you know you, the way things have happened, you you've probably got Manchester United, Liverpool, Arsenal, Spurs on, on one side, Manchester City, Chelsea, Newcastle, I, I guess on the other. Just the way they're sort of. You know the power struggles we've seen, the you know, the legal challenges by Manchester City recently. The, you know the takeover of Newcastle by Saudi Public Investment Fund. Uh, they're sort of new kids on the block. So I I, I think that you know that that big six power block was whatever ten years ago up to twenty twenty one was quite powerful. Oh, I see. Uh, so 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 test my understanding. There's a fissure, if you will between what may have been perceived around the the ESL time as being a block of six and, and they've split off and almost become old money and new money. I think, it, yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you think the Premier League itself, and Richard Masters, for example, as the chief exec, has been under quite a lot of pressure these last 18 months as rules, particularly the PSR ones, which were written rather a long time ago, have been used in anger. And I, I'm just interested as, as an impartial observer what you thought or, or what your opinions are about what's, what's happened in the last 18 months in and around that, and particularly some of the punishments or not that Everton, Nottingham Forest and Leicester City have or have not endured um, regulation in and around football, uh, self-regulation at the moment, and governments are going to impose obviously external. Do you have a view about that and, and and the way fans react to Everton getting a punishment, Nottingham Forest getting a smaller one, Leicester not getting one at all? How do you think that reflects on 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 the competition? I think. You know, when you have a situation, and it's not it's not just football, it's not just the Premier League, it's in sport generally, when you're the competition organiser and then you're also sort of, you know, the, the, trying to enforce the, the rules as a sort of, so you're, you're sort of, as a sort of, as a governing organisation, obviously they're not the governing body because that's the FA, but they are the sort of governing um, organisation for, for those rules. That's... Um, that, that inevitably raises problems, um, and I think that's sort of exacerbated in the Premier League because you know you, the Premier League, the clubs are the owners, the shareholders, um, and they're you, know, you have the same strange situation where you know, you're, you're a shareholder and you said to have broken the rules, and it, it, it's it's all very it's all very messy to me, I think. And I don't, I think the Premier, Premier League's rules aren't great either. So, for example, um, you know, you have a situation with Everton, Nottingham Forest, and they're both accepted that they've broken the PSR rules. And yet Chelsea um, comply with them by the fact that they're allowed to sell hotels to themselves, uh, you know, make, to register a paper profit by selling the hotels from you know one part of the organization to to a, to assist a company 
Like the EFL doesn't allow that. UEFA doesn't allow that. The Premier League had the chance to close that, but it, the clubs, we're not talking the administration, the clubs all decided that they didn't want to close that loophole. So Chelsea can get away with it. Um, but other clubs which didn't do that or didn't know they could do that, for example, perhaps, um, end up having points deducted. So I think it's um, I think it's very messy, basically. And I don't... I don't think the rules are great. I think they need a, a proper looking at revising. I mean, I know they're getting rid of them at the end of the season, the PSR rules, and I think they have been showing up to be n- not great. But, um, you know, what, what do I think about people's... Re- I think fans naturally react. They don't like having points deductions. They think it's unfair. I don't, this is, I don't think this is a conspiracy. This is the fact that they were, you know, they got probably caught out by the COVID pandemic. Things went uh, too far, probably gambled a bit on success, didn't pay off and um, ended up in that situation. So it's not, I don't think there's a sort of conspiracy about this, but I I also don't think that the rules are particularly great. Mm, I mean, you, you open up a potential for a can of worms though, because you refer to the shareholders, which is obviously uh, the 20 clubs themselves, which every year changes. Um, you also talk about the administration, and I, and I guess you you're really referring to Alison Britton and uh, and and Richard Masters and and the non-exec board members of the Premier League. Do you think the administration of the Premier League have dealt with these challenges particularly well, or or not? Well, I don't know. I think for years, probably. Uh... You know the the Premier League's administration, certainly when Richard Scudamore was there, would sort of bent over backwards not to do anything um, to to the clubs because it, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? You know, mm. these, the clubs employ that they employ these people at the end of the day, and yet so you're you're basically taking on your employer in a way, and you know, I don't think anyone would feel comfortable. I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable taking on my employer. Um, so, but that's what the situation is. Um, if you're the Premier League and you're charging whoever it is, Everton, Leicester City, Forest, Manchester City, Chelsea, it's you're putting yourself in an uncomfortable position. Um, and I, I'm not quite sure. I, maybe it was you know a new leadership, Alison Britton coming in, maybe who looked at these various investigations that were ongoing and thought, you know, we need to apply these more rigorously. Um, Because we know there have been these conversations, haven't there, before with Everton, um, in previous seasons when there'd been sort of, you know, arrangements almost between the Premier League and Everton. And I think maybe those were the sort of things which happened more previously. Yeah, I, I think, and it's curious that you use the phrase arrangements because, of course, under the disciplinary procedures of the Premier League, the, the, the first time you appear on the naughty step is when the Premier League have those, as you rightly say, those conversations and agreements are reached on how you're going to correct your misdemeanour, if you will. And, and, and I think those sorts of conversations happen with Nottingham Forest and other clubs, right? Um but one of the accusations that came to the Premier League, both by Everton indirectly and very forcefully in public by Nottingham Forest, was the inconsistency and the almost saying one thing and doing another. Do you have a view whether there is a political play going on in there? Surely there can't be a political play going on between the board members of the Premier League. And does any of this come back to you know, Ratcliffe's view that the six need to have more influence than they do? Oh, I don't. I don't think that particularly. I mean, I, I, I do wonder if, if, if the Premier League were saw that the you know government were bringing in this independent regulator, mm. and were very worried about how far that regulator would go and whether whether it would affect their running of English football's top flight, and wanted to be seen to be imposing their rules properly. Um, so I, I think that's more likely I don't than the sort of, you know, the big six saying, you know, we, we, we need to uh, pushing them to take action on the PSR rules. I, I certainly haven't seen, heard any evidence or, um, 
you know, any clubs suggesting that the Premier League needed to take action over PSR specifically. Okay. I mean, what clearly, the, the, in my view, you may hopefully share it, what perhaps the most important stakeholder in football in this country should be the fans. And certainly Everton fans were particularly vocal and Nottingham Forest fans as well. And we've had clubs like Aston Villa's fans join in the fray because they feel that they've been constrained by some of the regulations and, and, and so on. But the accusation that the Premier League was making it up as they go along and almost knee-jerking into making changes in the regulations is something that Manchester City have confronted recently um, in, a, in a very formal and legal way. Do you think that's pressure being brought to bear just on themselves? And I don't, personally, I don't think the regs are fit for purpose, and I think you've alluded to that. What's the way out of this for the Premier League, and particularly come January, when no doubt at least one club is going to find themselves back on this PSR naughty step? Yeah. I mean, you know, the club has had an opportunity, for example, to agree a tariff didn't they like like the efl has mm. and, they, and they and they decided not to do it um this is the clubs themselves decided not to do it so i i think gen, i think that was a mistake because then you you know you then it you, be you more transparent know. wouldn't it yeah i think the lack of transparency generally is an issue um be much better if things were more transparent everyone and then because i mean it, it's only recently that uh, we even knew, I mean, that investigations were going on. Um, it, you know, when the for years and years and years, if a club was under investigation by the Premier League, they they wouldn't they they the, the clubs had decided that would remain confidential. So that mm. you know, we didn't even know that, and it's only in the last few years that you'd even know that a club in the Premier League would confirm if a club was under investigation or not. So the whole thing has been un, under sort of. Um, you know, shrouded in various bits of mystery for some time. Um, I think it's getting a bit better, but I, you know, I think whatever comes after PSR, uh, I think there has been a wake up call that things have to be more transparent. The um, things like the Leicester City case highlighted the fact that there were, you know, sort of fairly glaring issues over the fact that. You know, if you were relegated, then actually there was this sort of month where, after you were relegated, it, where you didn't you wouldn't you didn't have the opportunity to try to, to get yourself, you know, back within the PSR limit, mm. um, and so therefore that's why they won their case to say that they you know they hadn't breached the PSR limit because it wasn't fair. You know, once they were out of the out of the sort of Premier League's control. Then it was, you know, it was no longer applicable, and that could have been, you know, that could have been covered easily by the law, the rules, and they could have said, you know, laid it out in black and white so that there wasn't any sort of grey areas. So, absolutely right, and to me, that was a glaring error by the administration of the Premier League because it was they who appeared to have been um, keen for the, you know, the the if you like the the share to transfer from the relegated team Leicester to the promoted team, which I think was Luton, presumably just so they could have their annual general meeting and look forward to the next season. And if, if that event had taken place a month or so later, then Leicester would have been banged to rights. So it, it, it seems the Premier League itself doesn't understand its own rules. And, and so it's a bit rich to expect the clubs themselves to understand them. And I think we will move to the squad ratio. Oh, that's the intention, isn't it? Approach, which UEFA have already implemented. And that is hugely transparent in where it documents exactly what the punishment is for breach. Now, those punishments within UEFA are financial. Do you expect that to be the case with the Premier League as well? If they do introduce transparency, that they will remove this sporting punishment for an alleged sporting crime and just go the way of money? No, I don't think so. I, I'm pretty sure that they are going to have, ultimately have sporting sanctions. Um, I would be, I'd be very surprised if they didn't have that. Um, the, the indications I got when they were first setting up the the, the squad cost ratio, mm. which all, I mean, I think UEFA's isn't just financial. If, um, no, it, it ultimately becomes um, all the yeah. things. It, yeah, yeah. yeah, but it, it's a it's a sort of as you say, it's a transparent sliding scale. Mm. Um, 
and I think that's probably what will be the same as, as the with the Premier League. Yeah. So we use this next bit as a bridge between the past in this space and, and the future. Um, what was your view of when you heard how many tens of millions of pounds the Premier League had spent suing its own membership for these rules that we've just spent 10 minutes talking about? I mean, it just seemed crazy that forensic accountants and lawyers stroke barristers are making huge sums of money, which could be better spent elsewhere. Yeah, so I mean the the, the Everton case, didn't they? For the first one, it the it it showed up. I think it was five million pounds just on the first case alone with the Premier League's costs and mm. some pretty high um, money being paid to law firms, higher than than Everton were paying considerably. And I think mm. I think at Everton's legal representatives, I think to describe them as as eye watering. Yes, that's um, right. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I haven't sort of thought about this in, in detail as to whether I think it's right that the Premier League should be spending this money or not. I suppose you could argue that, you know, if, if the Premier League needs to prove its position um, and if it, you know, if it if it's once again to be a cheapskate about it, then it, the other clubs could say, well, hang on a minute, you've, you've just, you've, you've gone to this like, Thropney bit firm down the road, you know, you need to have proper people, <laughs> blah blah blah. So, no, they, I get they, probably, that, yeah. they probably can't win on that. Um, I, I, but I, yeah. I do think it, I do think that the, the amount of money the Premier League has had to spend on lawyers over the PSR case, um, the Manchester City cases, the Chelsea case, um, is just incredible. I think they budgeted last season for it to be eight million and they spent 48 million. Um, I mean, you know, people say that, oh, that's only the cost of a, you know, a, a sort of semi good striker, but it's just, I think it's a lot of money. Yeah, it was nearly £50 million that was not spent on grassroots football from, from where I sit. Um, I also um, take a view, we, we have a business show on our channel, which goes out every week or so, and we're often using the phrases that what we see are symptoms. So I think the huge amounts of money spent on legal fees, I think, is a symptom, and you alluded to it earlier, that the, the regulations or the laws, if we want to call them that, of the Premier League probably were not uh, drafted when they were drafted to anticipate what they're going through now. So, But that's historical, and that's the past. And you've mentioned Chelsea a couple of times, and I'm minded to, to observe that it's probably 18 months now, maybe, or certainly last year, since UEFA... Uh, punished uh, Chelsea for what happened around the time that their ownership changed and the Premier League is still investigating and, th and this is about offshore payments uh, and so on which I guess could ultimately lead to PSR type breaches what's your thoughts on that what the heck are the Premier League doing still investigating something which UEFA at the European level have long since punished Chelsea for well I, I think the, they're sort of not quite comparable because UEFA has a time bar, um, which we saw with their Manchester City. It's case. quite short, so, yeah, three years is it or something? Yeah, yeah I think it's five years. Is it, it really? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so they can they can they can only they can only go back um, to twenty eighteen. Uh, actually, the most serious cases were uh, alleged to have happened well before that. So we're talking. 2012, 2013. That's 2014. right. Yeah, yeah. There's a good ten years of uh, interesting goings on, isn't there? Yeah. So, um, so it, it it is much more complex for for the Premier League to look into those, and I, I actually think it. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is the case, but that some sort of football leaks or not. It wasn't actually the football leaks. What was it? It was the um, Cyprus Papers um, produced a whole load of more information around some of this, which I think came out to, right at the end of last year, um, providing more detail. And I, I actually think some of those things that the, the Premier League's investigation didn't even know about. So that was another sort of tranche of investigations it was then going to have to to sort through. Um, 
I think Richard Master said in, in August, I wasn't there, but he did say it was coming close to a conclusion. Uh, so, but you do think this is like self-reported by Chelsea's new owners. Mm. So they would have handed over everything. Um, so you are then, you do wonder what the sort of delay is if they've handed over everything. Maybe, you know, the pre people who worked on the Abramovich have got, I presume they've got their lawyers involved. And that's that's caused some of the delays, um, but you know we're talking for people who haven't followed it closely. That, that, you know, for example, suggestions that um, money around transfers was paid to um, offshore accounts, mm -hmm. middlemen, people. For example, the transfer of Samuel Eto and Willian from a, a Russian club to Chelsea that um, people connected with a Russian club were, were, were paid money, sort of on the side to sort of sweeten the deal. And that money never appeared in sort of Chelsea's accounts. Mm. Um, if that's the case, obviously that is a sort of fairly serious breach. Um, you then go into the whole thorny problem of what do you do to a club whose owners did this and then sold it and they're no longer there. Um, it's still the club who broke the rules, isn't it? And that's yeah. I'm sure that is how the uh, the statutes, um, the Premier League rules will say that. Yeah, I mean, um, I wrote an article. Not... Sorry, big bang. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, I was going to say, if you're a Chelsea supporter, you might think this is, um, you know, the, oh, you know, the, why should we have whatever it might be, points deductions, or you know, which it could easily be. Or it should, I mean, mm. if if, it ever, if Everton can be dock that many points for overspending what what do you do when someone's doing secret payments on the side well absolutely uh, doing secret payments on the side not to break the rules that both everton and nottingham forest have been punished for which was post the esl and there was some pretty high profile journalists saying don't punish the fans there's a whole host of contradictions there now i wrote a substack article on this perhaps 12 18 months ago whatever it was now and and chelsea's new owners set aside I believe, on or around £100 million to deal with what they think may be the consequences of these failures to, com failure to comply with the regulations. And all we can get out of the chief exec of the Premier League is it's drawing to a close. Um, I just think it's unsatisfactory, to be honest. And Man City, of course, are in the throes of this now um, in the sense of being prosecuted, we use those words, by the Premier League. Have you got a feel for when we'll find the outcome of that? I mean, I think, well, we know that when it started, so, and that it, I think it was scheduled for 10 weeks, the, the so-called 115 alleged rule breaches. Um, so by, you would expect that they would be done around, you know, get some sort of outcome beginning of February. Uh, I know there, there's, I think, the Premier League and the other clubs are pretty keen to have it resolved before the end of the season, including an appeal, which you would think would would make sense. Um, you know, because I actually think you know that's another of the issues around the whole PSR thing, which they 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 did change the rules after after Everton, didn't they? Mm -hmm. After the first case, that um, you know you had this situation where Everton basically having two PSR breaches dealt with within the same season. Mm. Hence the accusation of making up it up as you go along, and it seems only natural if, we're talk if I'm talking about that, is to say clearly um, reactive changes in the rules were applied, um, and it recently with Manchester City's case has been brought into question around Newcastle, wasn't it? And and of course Newcastle is now back in the throes of publicity around state ownership. There's too many of these coming along all at once, isn't there, really, for the Premier League to be able to deal with? There's certainly lots of challenges. I mean, I do think it's... Um, it, to, to me, it's one of the things that come with, with state-connected ownership. Um, when, you, when, you, when you have these sort of very, very, you know, incredibly rich outside forces um and they, they you know they they don't like taking no for an answer and want to you know 
Newcastle, I'm sure, want to do what Manchester City have done, um, and you know, say that everybody getting in their way um, is is a problem. Then that is definitely going to create issues for the Premier League and the other clubs. What What's your view, Martin? If because um, I, I do believe we've been told in the past, and certainly Amanda Staveley is in and around this that. Newcastle was not going to be owned by the Saudi Arabian government, and therefore there was no issue there. Um, maybe there was some political involvement from the UK government at the time. What happens if there's hard evidence that actually, as many people may suspect, Newcastle are indeed owned by the Saudi Arabian government and heavily influenced by it? What happens then? Well, I mean, it's quite... It's quite difficult, isn't it, to mm. to prove? I mean, you know, the Saudi the sovereign wealth fund. It, it's almost like saying, if, if Britain had a sovereign wealth fund, you would think that was part of the British nation, wouldn't you? I mean, I would. Um, and I, you know, so it is to me. It is part of the. It is part of the the government. The you know the Saudi public investment fund. The you know the. Is the, the the board of the Saudi Public Investment Fund is basically made up of, of the Saudi government? Hmm. Um, you know wh whether those government people have a direct influence over the running of Newcastle United. I mean, the club would say that they don't, and it's you know, it, and there are these sort of these walls put up to ensure that's not the case. Um, but I mean, I think it's. It's it's quite difficult to maintain that division, isn't it? I, I, I yeah, say. well, having lived and worked in the Middle East and particularly Saudi Arabia, um, albeit quite a long time ago now, I can rest assured that if one of the five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand um, members of the royal family wants something to happen, it generally happens, you know, <laughs> and, and, and therefore it's utterly naive of the Premier League to say we've been assured that there'll be no government involvement, right? Um, and, and therefore, that just becomes an issue to deal with in the future, unfortunately, for them. I, I just think there's an accumulation here um, where, again, FIFA try to hold strong that there should be no political stroke government involvement in, in, in sport and in their sport, football in particular, where it appears that in English football it's happening all the time. Am I being fair there with that? I think it's... Um... So, I mean, FIFA's thing is there should be there's no government involvement in the running of the na of the, the national game. So they, they would say like the football association. Mm. Um, uh, so that's why there have been sort of some question marks, I think, from UEFA over the this this new regulator. Mm. Um, I, there's there's nothing I don't think we should necessarily stop, you know countries and nation states owning clubs I and mean, with Paris Saint-Germain and Qatar I know it's Absolutely. Qatar sports investments I mm. mean um but it, you know the, these are bankrolled by by countries um Manchester City would say they're not owned by Abu Dhabi they're owned by Sheikh Mansour it just happens to be the deputy prime minister of the United Arab Emirates and mm. so because you know what I've always wondered you know should there be a rule saying nation states shouldn't own football clubs you then go and you know get into the sort of tricky position of people saying they don't you know Sheikh Mansour is an individual or you know you could, you could for example somebody could represent you know, a Chinese government representative could buy a football club be funded completely by China but insist that they're a they're a sort of a separate entity um and it's actually very difficult to prove otherwise. Mm. Um, of course, I think that's um, a pretty balanced view, to be honest, Martin, about the challenges facing, let's call them administrators, and notwithstanding, I think they perhaps could do a better job. But of course, a lot of what goes on in and around media these days is social media, of course, isn't it? And the echo chambers, that might be X, you know, a platform formerly known as Twitter and all that sorts of stuff. How have you seen that change in your job? Because you started off back in the day in Hull with a local newspaper with quite a large um, distribution, I would imagine. And lots of people read the newspaper and that was where they got their source of news. 
while we're recording this, something's happening on social media right now. So what's your views about how that's changed your role and whether that's good, bad, indifferent uh, and the like? Yeah, I mean, it has changed it completely. I think it's sort of, yeah, Twitter really changed it. Um, I think certainly when I started in, in doing this particular job in, in 2000, so like for a few years, um, I mean, certainly actually initially, the, the sort of, you know, the fax machine would come and you get a sort of press release or press release from the Football Association announcing something on the fax or, or the Premier League or whatever. And then you, you know, you do it for the, for the press association wire, and then you know the first the sort of world knew about it was you know your story would be read out on Radio Five or something like that, um, and then sort of emails came in. You know, then actually things started with, with emails very soon, mm. very soon after that, um, and that that took over from faxes. I don't. There, Certainly, faxes was certainly for a couple of years. The, the, the fax machine was uh, still part of my office, and I, I was pretty pleased to get rid of it just to get that email. <laughs> you but do realise you do realise that the demographic of this show might mean there's a whole host of people who don't know what a fax machine is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and that mobile Google phone, Google mobile, it, yeah. yeah, absolutely, and that mobile phones used to be attached to a battery the size of a car battery, you know, yeah, and then there'll be some of our audience who don't even know what a car battery is because, of course, you know, unless it's an electric vehicle. Um, but but, actually, when I went to um, the twenty. 2002 World Cup in Korea. I was based in, it was Korea and Japan. I was based in Seoul. And great city. The Koreans were so far ahead of us in technology. It was incredible. And I remember, like, you know, sitting in the, in the, the underground train system, watching people uh, sending emails on their phones while underground, thinking, you know, this is what? You know, I've still got the old <laughs> Nokia 2210 or whatever it was called. Are you showing your age now? <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, so actually, you know, when when, you, when we started getting like the old Blackberries where you could, um, with a keyboard. Oh, I remember Blackberry. Yeah, they, that was they, they, so that was that was fairly transformational. Could do very quick stories just on, you know, you get a get an email, the press release, and then copy and paste it into an email, and it would be on the wire, the press association within sort of ten minutes. That was a sort of game changer. And then when governing bodies and clubs and started putting stuff on social media which was probably around about 2010 i think when they sort of started doing it in a big way they did it before that a bit but they really it really took off then um then suddenly the you know the world and his wife um were that they could they could see stuff before the sort of traditional media mm was was reporting it and then that becomes a that was a challenge for the media you know clubs were clubs weren't sending media announcements for them to put out you know we've got a new player they were putting it out mm. and it's it, it so it's you know how did the media react to that how much do you enjoy instant feedback that social media brings about your opinions and your stories um well, I mean, you know, a lot of you get so much grief. Yeah, you've had a few spats on uh, Twitter, I think. So it, it goes with yeah, the territory. Yeah, I mean, yeah. most of, most of the time, I sort of let it wash over me. Um, you know, sometimes, if I think it, you know the the criticism is unfair, especially if I'm reporting something, mm. like you report something and then you get accused of being a sort of mouthpiece for the Premier League, and mm. you know, I can say now the Premier League has never given me a single story on a PSR case. They, they they really haven't because they're terrified of being found out if they were to do that mm. you know their owners would sack them the owners of the clubs would sack them so they're all you know they're terrified of sort of breaching the confidentiality things for sure oh well, they must have left mm. you off the uh, distribution list then martin because there's certainly some journalists who behave that they like in the past they have anyway that they do get those briefings and and i think you're quite right earlier when you said that it is all kept quite, you know, private at the moment, which is the right answer, mm. I think. Yeah. But, but it was a bit like I mean, the I, Wild I, I West think, in, in the start of 2023, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I did a story 
at the start of this year saying that um, Everton and Nottingham Forest um, were in in danger of. Uh, well, I think Everton, they were all, uh, a second, Everton, it would be the second uh, PSL breach for Everton sure. and Nottingham Forest being in breach. Um, but that that wasn't at all anything to do with either the clubs or the Premier League. Um, that was a combination of speaking to a couple of lawyers and just doing some simple maths. Mm, absolutely. Um, yeah. And Kieran Maguire, um, I checked it out with him and he, he'd done the same sort of maths. So, and, it, you know, it, it just, you know, turned out that was the case. Um, so that there wasn't any sort of, you know, people sending messages or a carry pigeon or whatever. <laughs> no, no. I mean, that, and that almost spins right back to the beginning of what we spoke about. That's doing a little bit of investigation, a little bit of research, offering an opinion, which turned out to be absolutely right. So as we draw to a close, uh, if you would humour me, I would like to ask you about my team, which is Everton, and the saga that is the change of ownership. And so I'd like a, a little pricey of uh, about uh, as an observer how you've seen that and what, if any, view you have about the potential owners, um, hopefully relatively soon, of the Free King Group. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's sort of been um, touched by desperation. Many, if you, I mean, if you look at some of the um, the people Everton have, have sort of got into bed with, or you know, done these period of exclusivity deals um all that machinery has, has done mm. um I, I just can't believe some of them that we were got through like um the kaminskis for example really really easy due diligence which probably took me a day to find out the sort of list of very dubious um court rulings and legal challenges in the usa and and um actually a sort of no evidence at all of, of funds behind them mm. um yeah they you know they were they were seen as being sort of you know genuine purchases um and i mean that was a classic one so when, when i did the story like pointing out all these issues with them i had loads of grief from everton fans who thought i was being sort of you know you know hated the club or doing down the club i, was, I, I felt i was protecting the club um and it turned out they went to, you know, went tried said they were going to buy a club in Belgium, and uh, complete and the, the deal completely collapsed, and they've been completely discredited. The Kaminskis, mm. so that was that. And then the whole seven 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 issue. I mean, you know, a lot of people, not not just me, other people than me, did much more work on the the whole seven seven seven. Um, in a paper house, basically. Mm. And Jossie Moore did some great work on that. They did some really good work on that, yeah. Mm. Um, and it, so, seven 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 put they put they did you know they 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 put their money where their mouth was, or somebody they, else's you know, they, money where their mouth was. Or yeah. mouth where money where their mouth was, but you know they they did provide a lot of money to Everton, didn't they? As they loan. did a few hundred million pounds. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So you can say. That's maybe that's why Mishiri was convinced that you know they did have this, but mm. it it didn't it didn't take much to realise that you know it what this was built on was pretty unsteady ground, and mm. Everton dodged a bullet there definitely, definitely. Um, so, and again, you know, I, I actually I think most fans would realise what the situation was was of seven 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 pretty real. Sure. We did, pretty, we did, quickly. we did. Yeah. So, what does your research tell you about the freaking group? Well, I, I'm hoping that, from what I know, that they've got a lot of money. Um, you know, this isn't borrowing other people's money to spend, and I, I think the fact that they sort of walked away initially and then came back is actually quite a good sign, mm. because you know that you know they are proper business people. I, from what I know, what I can gather, what I've researched. Um, and they're not afraid, you know, they're not afraid to make tough decisions for what they think is the best thing. I mean, look at Mourinho and Roma. You know, Absolutely, just, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so 
I think for Everton fans, this this could be the the, the people that they've been looking for 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 many years to to change their fortunes, and it makes good sense for them. The freaking group. I mean, they got you know brand new stadium. Mm. Look at uh, look look how much of an issue that is for other clubs. Look at Chelsea. Um, you know, how much they were bought for, and they still don't have. You know, they've still got a stadium which. You know, it's, they desperately, in order to compete financially, they, they're going to have to build a complete new one. At, and in London, what sort of expense are you looking at that? Crazy money, crazy money. I think that's a good way, uh, place to leave it, Martin, if that's okay by you, taking quite a bit of your time. Uh, maybe you should come back on again, even when the freaking group are actually the Everton owners. But for now, thank you so very much, and uh, you have a good day. No worries, enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care.